Let's say we have an array of email addresses and we want to find all the Gmail users in the array. That's easy. We just loop over the array, check if the email ends with gmail.com and then just put it in the new array. This is written in JavaScript, but these concepts are so universal, I promise you'll be able to follow along and get something out of this video, even if you don't use the language. Probably a lot of you already know that you could also use the built-in filter function to get the same result. But I've noticed that a lot of people don't have a good understanding of what's actually going on under the hood. So let's build up the filter function from first principles ourselves to fully understand it. So this code is kind of like a search function, filtering out all the elements that end with the substring. This sounds pretty useful, so let's factor it out into its own function. Okay, this is pretty good, but let's say we also need another piece of code where we only want to find the email addresses that start with a certain string. Just like before, we can loop over the array, but this time we filter out those that start with our search term. This also seems pretty useful as a search function, so let's extract that out again. Now let's take a look at the bodies of these two functions. They look pretty similar, right? In fact, this part in the condition is the only thing that isn't the same. This code isn't very dry, is it? The array.filter function that is built into many languages is a way to get rid of this redundancy. We can actually get rid of these two functions and replace them with just two lines of code. But to fully understand how this works, we're now going to do something seemingly unrelated and then come back to it. What I'll show you now might seem really basic and pointless, but I'm using extremely simple examples on purpose so you can focus on the new concepts. In fact, I'm going to start by going back to Hello World. I promise this will all make sense in the end. I want to start by introducing a crazy idea. In many languages, we can store a function in a variable. Not the return value or a result of the function call, but the function itself. What do you think is printed on the console when this line is executed? The answer is nothing, because we didn't even call the function yet. Notice that there are no parentheses here, to call the function. However, we can use our variable to call the function. In most languages, it's also possible to define functions inside of other functions. Let me redefine the hello world function here in line of the other function. As you can see, the syntax here is slightly different, but it's almost the same as this part up here, defining the body of the function. In JavaScript, these are called arrow functions, but other common names are lambdas and closures. But really, they're just functions defined within another function. Sometimes they're also called anonymous functions because unlike this function up here, this one doesn't have a name, it's anonymous. Of course, you could argue that the variable name is the name of the function, but later we will see examples where there truly is no name at all for the function. Just like before, we haven't called the arrow function yet. So let's actually call it. Just like regular functions, these anonymous functions can of course also have parameters or return values. Here's an example with a single parameter. Okay, but if we can store a function in a variable, what else can we do with it? Here's another crazy idea. What if we passed a function to another function as a parameter? This function here has a single parameter and it's expected to be another function, which is then immediately called inside the body. I know this seems pretty useless and it is at this point, but hear me out. We can now use this function to call other functions. Here, for example, I'm storing the print hello world function in a variable, and then I use the call this function with the example variable as an argument. The call this function will then immediately call the supplied function, and this will then print hello world. Of course, in this simple example, we wouldn't even need the variable at all. We could also have done this instead. Note that this does not work, however, since we'd already be calling the print hello world function here, which does not return anything. And then this line would result in an error. A function like this one that receives another function as a parameter has a special name. It's called higher order function. Of course, we can also use anonymous functions as arguments to our higher order functions, like this. We can even get rid of the variable here and inline our arrow function like this. Now it might make a bit more sense why these are called anonymous functions, since now that we got rid of the variable, the arrow function really has no name at all. Now how can we apply this knowledge to our initial example? Remember, the goal was to get rid of the redundancy here, and the only parts of these functions that are different are these parts in the condition. Let's see how we can fix this. First, let's extract the condition out. And for simplicity, let's hard code the search term for now. Now let's wrap that into a function. And then we can replace the old condition in the if statement and call the function instead. Since it's no longer needed at the moment, let's also get rid of the search term parameter. While we're at it, we can also rename the function to just filter. Now let's actually get back our array to filter and call the function. 
This works because the ends with Gmail function receives a string, and each element in our array is a string, which is then passed to the function. It then returns a Boolean because the ends with function returns either true or false. This Boolean is then used in the if statement to decide whether or not that element should be added to the results array. So what we can do now is just write another function with the same type signature. For example, this one that finds all the email addresses that start with Jack. Then we can just swap out the function call in the condition here. Of course, then we will get a different final result. Okay, this is pretty nice, but we still have to modify our filter function directly. But now we can apply the trick we learned earlier and add a function parameter to our filter function. Then we can replace the function call in the condition with our parameter. Now we can just supply the correct function that we want when we call filter. Pretty neat, right? It's worth examining this filter function parameter that we just added for a moment. In TypeScript, we can write its type signature like this. It's a function that receives a string and returns a boolean, which is exactly the same type signature that our two functions here have. Since the type signatures of these functions both fit, we can now swap them out as needed when calling the filter function. When I see other developers struggling with filter, map, and reduce, it's usually because they don't fully understand what types they're dealing with when calling these functions. So whenever you run into a problem with these, just take a moment and make sure you fully understand what the data types of all your parameters and return values are. Okay, we can now even get rid of these named functions and just replace them with anonymous functions directly in line. All right, this is pretty good, but it's still a bit verbose. So in a lot of languages, there's syntactic sugar that you can use to further shorten this. If the filter function only has one argument, you can omit the parentheses around it. If the body of the function only has a single line of code in it, you can omit the return keyword. In that case, we can even get rid of the curly braces. All right, there we have it. We've built up filter from first principles. The built-in filter function in most languages is a method on the array type. So instead of supplying the array as an argument, we just call filter on the array directly. Let's take a look at the map function next. The name map confused me quite a bit when I first learned about it. I think a much better name would be convert or transform, since usually we use it to transform each value in an array. For example, we could use map to transform all the values in this array to uppercase. It's called map because you're mapping each element from the old array to a value in the new array. To understand how this works, let's see how we can implement map ourselves. As before, we start by looping over all the elements. This time, we transform the elements to uppercase before inserting them into the resulting array. Let's wrap that in a function and just rename everything to make it a bit more general. Okay, now we'll apply the same trick here as before, where we take this part here and replace it with a mapping function. Since the function is no longer just about uppercasing, let's rename it to be more general again. And let's supply the mapping function to transform each element to uppercase. Now for each element in the array, our mapping function will be called in the loop and the mapped or transformed element will be inserted into the result. Finally, let's take a look at reduce. This one is probably the most difficult to understand, but it's also quite useful. A common example is that we might want to join together some strings, like the different kinds of fruit here, with a keyword in between. This day is bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. The built-in reduce function can help us with that. Notice that the anonymous function here has two arguments this time instead of one. Again, to fully understand, let's build this ourselves from scratch. We'll start by retrieving the first element from the array and then looping over all the other elements. Note that the for loop here starts at index one, not at index zero. We then get the current fruit from the array and concatenate it with the previous element and our filler string that goes in between. Note that I'm appending to the previous string here so it'll get longer on each iteration. After the second iteration, we're already at the end of the array and we're done. Now let's wrap that up into a function again and call it. Then we can do the same trick from before, adding a reducer function as a parameter and calling it on each iteration. Finally, we can once again use an anonymous function to get back the original behavior. There's one problem with this function that you may already have noticed. What happens when the input array is empty? Well, since we're trying to access the first element of the array and then later try to do stuff with it, 
we would get an error. To prevent this from happening, we can add an optional parameter to our reduce function with a default value. We then check if the parameter was given, and if so, we use it as our initial value. Otherwise, we use the first element in the array. When we use the initial value though, our for loop shouldn't start at index one anymore, because then we'd be skipping the first element in the array. So let's introduce another variable, the start index, which is either set to zero or one, depending on where we start the loop. Now we can add an empty string argument when calling our reduce function. And since the array is empty, the for loop will be skipped and an empty string will be returned. We can also add the same argument to the built-in reduce function. Unfortunately, the function now doesn't return the correct result anymore when the array isn't empty. So we also have to slightly modify our reducer function to accommodate this. Feel free to pause the video and think through the for loop one more time to see how the control flow works now. What's really nice about filter, map, and reduce is that they can be easily combined. For example, let's say we want to keep all fruits that start with A or B, we can use filter. And then we can use map to convert them to uppercase. One downside of chaining these functions like this is that we will loop over almost the entire array for each of these lines. Whereas if we did all of this work in a single for loop, we would only have to loop over the array once. So when you have large amounts of data, there can definitely be a performance penalty when using this. Some languages can optimize this out though, and the above code is arguably easier to read because each operation, the filtering, the mapping, and the reducing is separated from each other. Whereas in the loop version, it's all kind of jumbled together. Another thing that often happens in garbage collected languages like JavaScript is that filter, map, and reduce, and higher order functions in general, produce more garbage than when using loops. One of the reasons for this is that these functions always create a new array instead of modifying the old one in place. So keep that in mind, but remember that if you're concerned about performance, it's always worth doing benchmarks first before jumping to conclusions. I hope you enjoyed this quick look under the hood of filter, map, and reduce. You can find all the code from this video on my website, link in the description below. I'm still working on my highly interactive Git cheat sheet, so if you want to be notified when that's released, please go to my website, philomatics.com slash git cheat sheet and leave your email there. Also check out this video on git rebase, which explains the command using detailed graph animations. My next video will be on git again. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Have a great day and thanks for watching Philomatics.